Yeah, I'd like to uh, thank Bill for the uh, invitation. I was uh, very excited to, to get it. I mean, who doesn't want to come to Houston in the middle of summer? But uh, um, no, it's, it's actually good to be back. I spent a good part of last year coming down to Houston Methodist and monitoring there and uh, maybe worked with some of you there. But it's, uh, it's just so critical because as neuro, neuro monitoring people and you anesthesia people, we really do work in concert. Uh, to provide the best patient care possible. So it's, it's an important opportunity to kind of make sure that we all are understanding each other's perspectives. So anyways, uh, lots to get to. Let's get started. Okay, so I wanted to go over a little bit of the history of neuromonitoring. Uh, and it's hard to kind of know exactly how far back to, to go. You could think of Galvani and Volta stimulating, you know, frog's legs or if you wanted to uh, look at anything to do with electricity itself, goes back to ancient Greeks and Egyptians, but, but for our purposes, we'll start with Richard Caton, uh, who in 1875 reported in the proceedings of the British Medical Association that he'd successfully recorded electrical uh, activity off of the living brains of rabbits in this case. So that seems like a relatively momentous uh, finding, but in fact, he sort of faded into obscurity and nothing much was, was uh, done on that until uh, more than 50 years later when Hans Berger then cited Caton's work uh, in 1929 when he was discovering the alpha frequency brain waves, which was the beginning of EEG. Uh, so he had a system where a pen would deflect upwards for a negative charge, downwards for a positive charge. So if you get a pen deflecting up and down based on the charge it's recording and you sort of scroll some paper under it, then you can get a printout of that electrical activity, uh, which makes sense, EEG is electroencephalography, the, the writing of the electrical activity of the brain. So that was sort of the origins of EEG, 1929, still in use today in the operating room. In the 60s then, uh, with Harrington rods and, and Lukey wires, you know, sublaminar wires and things like that, surgeons became more able to make much more aggressive corrections on spinal deformities like scoliosis. Uh, uh, with those more aggressive surgical techniques came an increase in iatrogenic sequela, unfortunately, so they started to look for ways to sort of evaluate the integrity of the spinal cord while they were doing these more aggressive procedures. And uh, here's Pierre Stagnera, French surgeon. Um, has anyone here, how many have done Stagnera wake-up tests intraoperatively? Not, no one, yeah. So. <laughs> So what he essentially charged uh, Catherine Bozell, his anesthesiologist, with doing was to uh, wake the patient up while they're still prone, probably in an adolescent patient, and keep them right on the edge of being able to respond to commands to wiggle their toes, move their extremities so they can be evaluated clinically, but at the same time keep them comfortable enough that they're not thrashing around with this giant gaping wound the entire length of their back. So that's a very delicate technique that Catherine Bozell, you know, developed and was able to perfect. Um, but, you know, Stagnera is the surgeon. It's known as the Stagnera wake-up test. To me, it should be really the Bozell wake-up test, but uh, he gets all the credit, so let's kind of give him one of those. But. Uh, so that was... Um, a really sort of uh, risky way of evaluating the uh, neural integrity of the spinal cord. Um, people were looking for alternatives to that where they could maintain the patient under general anesthesia. So Benny Grundy, who's an anesthesiologist uh, in Cleveland with, with uh, Clyde Nash and Rich Brown, uh, helped them develop a technique to monitor the spinal cord function while still under general anesthesia. And they, they decided to use somatocentury evoked potentials, which we'll see are mediated up the dorsal column and are able to be recorded what, without having to wake up the patient. Uh, so this was um, maybe an improvement over the more risky clinical evaluation. A group in Japan at the same time, Tamaki and his anesthesiologist, Shimoji, had uh, worked on a more invasive technique along those same lines trying to keep, a, you know, keep the patient under general but still be able to evaluate. And this involved uh, subdurally placed electrodes, so it was more invasive. It didn't catch on over here, but it was another attempt at, uh, at maintaining the integrity of those pathways without having to wake up the patient. Uh, 
the two groups got together in 1977 to really discuss the various techniques, and this was essentially the first neuromonitoring conference. Um, at that conference, Dr. Tamaki, the surgeon from Japan, uh, said this following quote, which I wanted to highlight specifically, the evolution of anesthesiology has influenced and supported the development of intraoperative monitoring. Um, and so I think that's a critical statement that we'll continue to see going forward. Uh, Robert Levine then, so the, another modality was developed and first used in the operating room in 1978, which is the brain stem evoked response. Shortly thereafter, Augie Moeller in, in Dallas uh, was working with Peter Janetta and really invented the microvascular decompression technique using brain stem auditory evo evoked responses in order to safely be able to perform that surgery. So that's kind of a case where uh, a procedure, a surgical procedure, was not, would not have been possible without concomitantly having some intraoperative monitoring to go with it. Um, the somatosensory evoked potentials, as I said, are an ascending sensory um, pathway, and there's plenty of case reports of intact SSEPs, and yet the patient wakes up with a motor deficit because it's really not monitoring the motor pathways directly. You're, you're inferring what the integrity of the motor is from your SSEPs. So that was a shortcoming that was early on realized, and Merton and Morton uh, then sort of looked for a way to uh, run some signals through the descending motor pathways. And in 1980, they developed this transcranial motor e evoke potential technique. There's Merton getting his head zapped uh, to develop, uh, to, to generate some motor evoke potentials in, in the classroom there. And the reason he's in the classroom or the laboratory and not in the operating room doing these motors is because at the time, in 1980, the typical technique from an from anesthesia point of view was nitrous and halogenated gases, and that, that technique precludes the recording of MEPs in general. So this was a laboratory finding that wasn't yet able to, uh, you know, be used clinically in the operating room. Uh, in an effort to sort of get around the pitfalls of that anesthetic technique at the time that was prevailing, it's something called neurogenic MEPs were investigated where, uh, again, it's more invasive. Some um, needle electrodes were inserted in adjacent lamina in the spine and they were attempting to stimulate, you know, proximal to where the wound was and then record something off distally to that. And that way you're bypassing all the synapses where your drugs are taking effect and it should be sort of relatively resistant if you're just generating responses at, uh, high and low in the spinal cord. And in the meantime, uh, techniques in anesthesia were evolving as well. And so this 1991 paper talked about finally the use of propofol in the operating room and what kind of uh, effect that would have on motor evoked potentials. So we're starting to get you know, some coming together of the anesthesia evolving, the, uh, the intraoperative monitoring evolving, and we're getting into something close to where it is today. Rich Talikas, who He's a PhD, but he was in the Department of Anesthesia at, uh, at Rush in Chicago. Um, took a look at these neurogenic MEPs in 2000 and using collision studies, was able to essentially disprove them as pure motor. What was happening was there was some um, orthodromic motor component to those responses, but also some antidromic sensory. And if uh, one or another of those elements of your response went away, you're not sure whether that was the sensory of the motor, so they're not really that useful, and they therefore fell out of favor. But, uh, and, and we now have the transcranial evoked potentials, which are a pure motor response. We now have some anesthesia techniques that are allowing us to use those in the operating room. And so that's where we are today with the multimodality technique of motors sensory EMG, that's sort of the gold standard of neuromonitoring, but it really wasn't until 2000, relatively recently, uh, that, that that sort of became the gold standard. So as we've seen with the contributions throughout the history of neuromonitoring, really the development and advancement of it has been in collaboration with anesthesia um, and will continue to be in the future. So it's definitely something that you all can participate in if you find an idea that's going to help uh, improve the delivery of this interoperative monitoring.